All right, so we were um, at Acts chapter 2, verse 1, and we began with the first word of verse 2, where uh, we said, suddenly, or when these people who were prayerfully waiting for the fulfillment of God's promise, um, you know, they experienced what God had in store for them. So uh, we, we will, you know, go, uh, at a comfortable pace, uh, wherever you know that, wh wherever possible, I'll probably try and be a little faster. But in other places where I think we had a really good discussion in the last session, very important questions you know, that we all have and we cl we clarified. So please feel free. Uh, we will not rush you know through the book of Acts. We will try and. Um, address the important issues so feel comfortable um we will catch up you know with with regard to speed so coming here to verse two and suddenly there came a sound from heaven of a rushing mighty wind okay so the manifestation of the uh baptism of the holy spirit you know upon them we see that it was so different from what they had in mind. I, I really don't know, know what they carried in their minds when Jesus said, you will receive the promise of the Father. You will receive power from on high. But the first time this happened, it looks very dramatic. I wish you know I had a video uh, that I could show you with the sound of the rushing mighty wind. You know, nothing less than audio visual. Um, uh, you know, would uh, would help us understand what exactly uh, uh, it looked like. So suddenly there was the sound of a rushing mighty wind. Now. Think about this. Why rushing mighty wind? Probably because the Holy Spirit, and I said this earlier, um, uh, was spoken of as breath and wind, both in the Greek and the Hebrew languages. So in the Greek language, the term pneuma uh, it is spelled P N E U M A, pneuma, um, refers to breath or spirit, and it is used for you know the Holy Spirit, pneuma, and ruah. That is the Hebrew word, uh, which is also the word used for spirit, and you know it it means breath as well, breath, air. Uh, and therefore, you know, a rushing mighty wind is almost symbolic of a powerful, you know, a, a, a powerful encounter with the Holy Spirit. He didn't come just as a you know, simple, gentle uh, breeze, still the Holy Spirit, but somehow this very first episode is dramatic that the Holy Spirit chose to come as a rushing, mighty wind with a sound. And notice, it also says, from heaven. So God chose to kind of send this wind from heaven, signifying that they were receiving the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And before I talk any further about the Holy Spirit, I want us to... Um, Remember that the Holy Spirit, uh, it, he's not a substance or he's not a, an impersonal power. He's not, you know, uh, just, just um, something exciting in scripture that we see, but he is a person. Okay, So I am saying he because he is a person uh, and he is the third person of the trinity so though we have these expressions that the rushing sound from heaven rushing mighty wind we always remember we're talking about a person the manifestation of that person and that can differ each time so uh, you know a sound from heaven and a rushing mighty wind in itself is not the holy spirit it's an expression of this person the holy spirit and he came with the power 
as promised by Jesus and the Father. So you see, you know, Trinity working in harmony, in, uh, uh, in unity, which is displayed here. So he comes as a rushing mighty wind and uh, scriptures say, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. So they were praying together and it happened. The Holy Spirit was poured out upon them. Then there appeared to them divided tongues of a fire and one sat upon each of them. Okay. So it's all very dramatic. So they're able to see these things. They heard the sound and it says that there appeared to be uh, divided tongues which sat upon each one of them. So there is a, a movie uh, called The Acts of the Apostles. And this movie is, uh, you know, it, it's made according to the book of Acts in the NKJV version. So you can... You know, it's available on YouTube for, for us to watch. So if you have the time, you could watch it. So they have tried to depict you know, to the best of their ability uh, what this uh, what this might have looked like, you know, as uh, in, a, in an audiovisual form. So you can have a look at it. But I have a picture here, which I will quickly show all of us. And I really hope that uh, it will help you. So uh, can you see the picture? So I said that there came a, a sound from heaven of a rushing mighty wind. Uh, so they were physically experiencing these things. And also you see that divided tongues of fire appeared. Okay? And it sat on each one of the uh, believers who were gathered in the upper room. So it, it was a very special experience which they had uh, we don't see you know any any such um, um, incident take place uh, as far as the baptism in the holy spirit is concerned you know later on in the book of acts we 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 will uh, we, we will study about it further but in this case you know, try to visualize it the sound, the wind, and you know, tongues of fire coming and appearing on each person. So why tongues of fire? Again, if we go back to what John the Baptist said about the Lord Jesus, he said that, you know, uh, I baptize you in water, but there will come uh, him, he who will baptize you in Holy Spirit and in fire. So he used the word baptism in fire. So you see here, there is also the appearing of tongues of fire on each believer. What does this fire signify? Similar to wind, I said that there are manifestations, right? But that's not it. Holy Spirit is not fire. But the Holy Spirit, he may manifest as fire. And fire refers to the cleansing of the believer. So baptism with power is to do the works of God, uh, you know, the way God wants it done with impact. And also the Holy Spirit baptism is an experience which is meant to cleanse us, you know, from the works of the flesh, from uh, all the filthiness of this world. So it's a very precious, no wonder God called it a gift and he really wanted every believer to have this gift of the baptism in the Holy Spirit and in fire. So that's exactly how it happened on that day with all these manifestations that you know people could uh, uh, make note of. Uh, so let's uh, go further. So we've seen that these tongues of fire sat upon them. Okay, now I'll read the, that passage a little more and then uh, share some observations. Okay, so uh, verse 3, then there appeared to them divided tongues as a fire and one sat upon each of them and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So if you can imagine with me an empty cup which is dipped into water. So when we talk about baptism, okay, that word uh, baptism is 
actually being immersed and that's what jesus had promised the believers that they would be baptized in holy spirit and in fire so they were dipped inside the holy spirit isn't it how can how can we be dipped inside the holy spirit so the holy spirit is an infinite being it's possible for us to be dipped in him okay and when we are dipped in him like that empty cup what happens when you dip an empty cup into a, a bucket of water automatically the cup will be filled with the water whether you like it or not that, that is going to happen so that's exactly what happens when people are baptized in the holy spirit and that's what we read here it the fire came and sat upon each one of them signifying that you know they were being baptized in the holy spirit and they were all filled they were baptized and they were filled with the holy spirit and began to speak with other tongues so one of the manifestations of the baptism in the holy spirit when i'm filled with the holy spirit what will happen you know the the basic we call it the basic gift of speaking in tongues uh, begins to uh, uh, you know come forth from us so they began to speak with tongues as the spirit remember they are baptized in the holy so they are in dipped into the holy spirit the spirit is giving them the utterance or utterance is usually language utterance is language so syllables words okay so all, all of that is coming out the spirit is giving it to the believers and they are what are they doing they began to speak with other tongues so uh, it's like you know there's a partnership going on the spirit is giving them utterance and they are speaking in tongues so here are some observations about this particular um, phenomenon in acts chapter 2 the holy spirit came upon the waiting disciples in a mighty way the wind of the spirit came from heaven in this case the outpouring of the holy spirit seems to have a natural manifestation with sound and the appearance of tongues of fire that came and sat upon uh, individuals the tongues of fire sat upon each individual and not collectively over the people uh, reminding us that you know uh, after we are born again or in the new covenant the empowering of the holy spirit is for each individual believer in the old covenant what do we see you know we see that the presence of god came upon the people of god so collectively they had the presence of god individually there were one or two people here and there based on the call of god on their lives you know upon whom the holy spirit came but not on everybody it did not come upon everybody but here you know the baptism in the holy spirit came individually upon every believer and so we understand that all believers can be empowered by the holy spirit there were 120 of them it doesn't tell us that it came only on the apostles or only on those with fivefold ministry gifts no it came upon all of them and they were all baptized in the holy spirit then we uh, see that they began to speak in tongues as the spirit gave them utterance okay so uh, th these are some of the key things that we note here now let's go further verse 5 now when this happened there were dwelling in jerusalem jews devout men from every nation under heaven why i already told us the day of pentecost people had come in to celebrate you know, uh, the festival or, or, or the harvest festival there so they were already present and they suddenly hear this so how did they even hear this now it is said that the upper room is a uh, probably not you know in in some residential area in jerusalem because 120 people uh, sitting in a large room uh, may not have been possible they the the city would not have had such large rooms in the residential areas but mostly you know in the temple complex uh, such a large room would have been available for them you know all this is speculation we really don't know you know how uh, if it is you know exactly correct or not but some uh, historians say this that the upper room was uh, very close to the temple or in the temple complex and which is why when the sound of the wind came now we can ask what sound 
did they also hear the sound of the rushing mighty wind answer could be yes answer could be no but there was definitely a sound from the upper room what what is that sound they all began to speak in tongues right so we don't know did they hear the wind or did they hear the tongues either case they heard you know some some noise coming from this upper room and they were all dwelling there so many of them were dwelling there and when this sound occurs verse six the multitude came together so it was easy for them to collect and gather uh, to come and check hey what's happening in this place why are these people making uh, such a noise and we're told uh, verse six i'm reading verse six and we're confused because everyone heard them speak in his own language i'm continuing from verse seven all the way till 13 then they were all amazed and marveled saying to one another look are not all these who speak Galileans? And how is it that we hear each in our own language in which we were born? Parthians and Medes and Elamites, those dwelling in Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, uh, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya, adjoining Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them speaking in our own tongues the wonderful works of God. So they were all amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, whatever could this mean? Others mocking said, they are full of new wine. Okay, so this explains to us that people gathered and they witnessed this event. And what happened next? They found these uh, disciples, 120 disciples, not all of them, but it says, now we don't know, you know, who and all among those 120 were speaking uh, in these legible languages. We have no idea. But, you know, in this noise came various languages that the audience could understand and if you just count up the uh, number of you know people groups in this there are at least 15 the people groups which have been mentioned in this passage alone that all these people could hear their own language but what did we read earlier uh, before we came here to uh, verse 5 we said that they were speaking right? Uh, in the utterance which the Holy Spirit gave them. So these 120 disciples don't have any idea what they are speaking, but the listeners are able to perceive their own known languages. All right. Fine. So, you know, we got that. Then what is the response of these people? We see that some of them are amazed and they are marveling, whereas uh, the others are mocking. Okay, so some say, whatever could this mean? They were amazed when they heard that people are praising God uh, in their own language. Uh, but some others said that they are full of new wine. So the manifestation of the spirit, even today, can elicit these two responses among people. People can either be amazed at what God is doing with his power. And people can also be mocking and say, oh, these people are crazy. You know, something is wrong with them. So the work of the spirit, right? It's, it's uh, uh, easy to receive and at the same time hard to receive uh, by people. So let me quickly just, uh, you know, show us a map um, that has the same regions that we, uh, heard of just now yeah so that will also be helpful something visual so you can see there people were gathered in Jerusalem and uh, uh, at Pentecost roughly you know, 30 AD some people say 33 AD so you know around that time Jesus had just died uh, uh, you know 50 days ago so it's not been too long. It's less than two months. And this is happening in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost. There are people gathered. You can see the names of you know, various um, uh, communities, people from different regions. They're all gathered in Jerusalem. So uh, this is how it was. Okay. 
All right, so let's move right along. Yes. So here, the tongues, which was made manifest, uh, is human languages. Now, did everyone speak human languages? Among those 120, we, we are not told many things, right? So uh, it, it depends on the interpretation that people come up with. But what we know in this passage is there were 120 people, but from those 120 people, we could perceive, you know, these many languages were there languages which could not be perceived possibly okay because when you look at first corinthians chapter 13 you see there that when i speak in the tongue of men and angels it says so there are two categories of languages one is the language of men one is the language of angels so when we speak in tongues it's possible that we speak either one of these category uh, of languages so people understand or people don't understand okay so we'll talk more about it uh, uh, later on now one more reason why you know these uh, um, uh, people who had gathered in jerusalem marveled uh, at uh, the galileans you know, speaking this language it says here right uh, look are not all these who speak galileans so apparently the galileans were not very learned uh, people you know, as per in in those times and secondly when it came to came to speaking uh, they were not very good you know with with their pronunciation and the, some guttural sounds uh, and, and other things they were not capable of doing that with excellence so which is why the marvel was even more that hey look at this uh, god is using a category of people who are not known for their oratory uh, and they are speaking in so many different languages this has got to be supernatural right uh, and at the same time you know so some of them marvel they they heard uh, the interpreter because they heard it in their own language they understood that these people are praising god so what is the role of the holy spirit uh, the role of the holy spirit is to glorify jesus so when people understood something in their own language what did what did it mean it meant glory to god it meant thanks to god it meant praise to god adoration of god okay so obviously we know that this was uh, coming out of the holy spirit's work in uh, in in the uh, life of these 120 believers but at the same time having witnessed this you know dramatic wonderful and chaotic event there were people you know, who uh, couldn't see God's work in this. And they just looked at it as confusion and they began to mock. They said they are full of new wine. These people are drunk. You know, something is completely uh, off here. And that was the response of another set of people. Okay. Uh, yes, sir, Charles, I, I see that you have a question. Please go ahead. Uh, it is not a question, Pastor, but... It is something that is so special uh, on how the, the, the Holy Spirit was doing and that verse, verse 13, the last end, and the people unknowingly say they are filled with new wine. Can you imagine? Little did they know about the new wine and they are speaking exactly a new wine the the inner thing that has happened to these people and they are filled with the holy spirit the new wine i when i was reading and i was like wow even even god made them utter out those that were listening in their own language and they are praising god but this work couldn't be done other than by a new wine Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, Charles. A very nice observation there. Uh, hadn't given attention or thought to that, but yeah, that's very special. Um, okay. So I'll first uh, answer uh, Brother Manoha's earlier question where he said, how can we clearly perceive that a person is baptized in the Holy Spirit? So there are you know, we have to look at the fruit. So the ultimate fruit is uh, what you would see as an outcome of one's life 
which is their walk with the Lord, outcome of their ministry, whether it glorifies Jesus or not, because that is the work of the Holy Spirit. Okay, but the person when one is baptized in the Holy Spirit, the immediate the Im immediate way in which, at least in the Book of Acts, the common uh, you know rung of the ladder is uh, speaking in tongues. So generally, people begin to speak in tongues. So that's how you know that, hey, they were baptized in the Holy Spirit, they got filled in the Spirit, and now they're manifesting the gift of the Spirit. Okay, so I, I hope that uh, answers your question. And, um, Pastor, and uh, yeah, yes. Uh, doubt I had is uh, oh. sometimes when people talk in tongues mm. and uh, uh, people will not be, sometimes people will not be sure. Whether it is really from the Holy Spirit. Mm, mm, mm. So yeah. some people have a doubt about some of the people speaking in tongues. Whether mm. it is really they are speaking from the Spirit of God. Mm, mm. Yeah. Yes, yes, I I I understand that, uh, brother. That's a real challenge that many people have. Uh, but what will help is to keep teaching about what the word of god says see we we all want everything um, to fit into our logic but somehow that's not the case you know uh, the way god deals uh, with us everything may not fit into logic so when we teach them the truth of god's word uh, and show them all these passages, right? That Jesus said, wait for the promise of the Father, and then it happened. The first time when it happened, you know, uh, uh, people were speaking in unknown languages. The Spirit gave them utterance, but they spoke. So when we teach, faith will come. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. So I think the one good thing to do is to just teach people and, and put this before them and leave it. Let it do its work. So a couple of times as they go over these things, their own questions, their doubts, they'll be able to overcome. And you know, even Seeing though the fruits will be really yeah. helpful. Seeing yes, the sir. fruits. Now knowing the fruits, seeing uh, seeing the fruits they bear, ah. by that actually we may perceive better, I think. That's the true. Fruits in their ministry. Correct, correct. Yeah. That that is the ultimate way. That is the ultimate way. Um, but the immediate is when one is baptized in the Holy Spirit, you um, see the manifestation through uh, a basic gift such as speaking in tongues. Okay. So uh, are, you, are you fine with that? Uh, yeah, is there anything yeah, yeah. more? No, no, no. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. It is clarified. It is clarified because small doubt I had because many people have doubts whether some of the sometimes people really speak by the spirit of god uh, oh, especially maybe in some of the traditional churches where uh, uh, speaking of tongues is made like uh, mandatory now sometimes people may try to talk <laughs> that is it even if uh, it is not from the spirit of god whether people are imitating so that is the doubt some people have now yeah, God forgive me if I'm wrong, but thing is, uh, this is a genuine doubt some of the people are having. Yes, yes. Thank you for bringing that up. Very honest uh, of you there. Uh, so it happens. I agree with you. Genuinely, when people are baptized in the Holy Spirit, comes tongues through the Holy Spirit. But <laughs> there are, you know, two other uh, sources. One is our own human mind, where yes, we. Yes make it up because you know we are so uh, that is it. yeah we've been conditioned you know when when uh, i go to church very uh, and i keep noticing this time and again that people speak in a language like this i can try to conjure it up and make it up okay which is very sad because uh, that, that we don't have to do that when god himself yeah. can give us the original tongues then the third one is a wrong source you know, we can have the demonic spirits also produce certain languages. So there's an imitation. Satan is, uh, you know, uh, he masters in counterfeit. 
So if there's something that's really good, he'll try to make a counterfeit. But as you said, in the long term, the, the true test is the fruit. What is the fruit? Is it glorifying Jesus or not? Then we are able to tell you know, that this is from God or not from God. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Uh, and uh, your next question here, uh, uh, explanation on Jewish festival of Pentecost and the coming of the Holy Spirit on the same day will be helpful. OK, um, frankly, I, I haven't researched too much about this. So uh, I don't think I can give you a satisfactory explanation for this. OK, I hope that's fine. I just encourage you to um, read it up. Yeah. OK, let's uh, go forward. Mm. So we saw how some people accepted what was going on, whereas the others uh, uh, were doubtful. And they mocked. And they said they are full of new wine. Uh, so coming to verse 14 here, it says, but Pete uh, standing up with the 11. Now, you know, we have to recognize that these 120 disciples have undergone a new experience and they are not the same okay, as they were the uh, previous day. So something has changed. And we will see this you know, showing itself up uh, throughout the Book of Acts. Immediately, you have Peter you know, displaying that boldness. Remember, Jesus said, you shall receive power, and you shall be my witnesses. Or you are going to talk about me. You are going to reveal me to the people. Peter's doing it. It says, but Peter, when he saw Oh, people are not able to understand uh, what this phenomenon is. He tries to explain. He just stands up. But Peter, standing up with the 11, raises his voice and said to them, the boldness you know, that comes upon him uh, and the heart for ministry, where he recognizes that people need to understand what is going on. Okay, By the Holy Spirit, empowering of the Holy Spirit, he speaks. He says, men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and heed my words, for these are not drunk as you suppose. So he's clarifying and he's telling them they're not drunk. Okay, And he also says, since it is only the third hour of the day, so uh, uh, it was 9 a.m. in the morning. And it's unlikely that you know you have 120 people who are drunk and making such a noise at 9 a.m. in the morning. Uh, so he's explaining to the onlookers, and you know, he says he he tells them what this is all about. He says, but this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. So he's quoting Joel's prophecy uh, in Joel chapter two, and he says, and it shall come to pass. In the last days, says God, which, which are the last days? The last days are uh, uh, the days after, you know, the death, burial, resurrection, uh, and ascent, actually resurrection of the Lord Jesus, where he promised us, you know, many things, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and, you know, the his glory will, the knowledge of, of the glory of God will spread around the world, all of that and the return of the Lord Jesus. So these are the last days. So we are living in the last of the last days. So right from the time the Lord Jesus, you know, he, he rose and you could say even ascended uh, is when, the last days actually started. So they were in the last days, the early church. We are also in the last days. So what is going to happen in the last days, says God? I will pour out of my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. And on my men servants and on my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they shall prophesy. I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So up until the 
uh, uh, return of the Lord Jesus, the things that are going to happen. So we see, you know, the description in the latter half, how um, there will be signs, there'll be wonders, there'll be blood, fire, vapor. So we, we know all of that, you know, the book of Revelation, Daniel, it talks about all of those things. But before that, the former uh, portion here talks about the uh, outpouring of the Holy Spirit, where God says, I will pour out of my spirit. Notice, you know, unless the Holy Spirit was infinite, God would not say, I will pour. Pour is um, God choosing to give in abundance. I'm not going to trickle or, you know, you won't have a drizzle of the Holy Spirit. But I am going to pour out of my infinite spirit on who? Everyone. I'm willing to pour it on everyone, on all flesh. But of course, we know uh, that one must be born again to receive of the baptism in the Holy Spirit. So those who are born again uh, will come specifically under that category of all flesh and you see that sons and daughters shall do what? Begin to manifest the works of the Spirit. Okay, so the works of the Spirit are what? The gifts of the Spirit. One gift is mentioned here, prophecy. They will prophesy. It's not to say that they will not move in other gifts of the Spirit, but it, it's just kind of telling them that you, know, you will move in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Then it also says, uh, you, young men shall see visions, old men shall dream dreams. Again, the work of the Holy Spirit, there will be supernatural experiences that people uh, walk in when they are baptized in the Holy Spirit. So uh, that's what, you know, or Peter was saying, but again, very interesting. You know, if you just go up and look uh, at verse 16, Peter saying, but this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In some translations, it says, this is that, this is that. But the thing together with me, what exactly happened? We've described it, you know, since, uh, you know, about half an hour now, that people were speaking in other tongues. But what did Joel say? Prophecy, dreams, visions. And what is Peter saying? This is that. Like, come on, Peter, hang on. This is not that. People are speaking in tongues. It's a completely different manifestation. But you are quoting Joel's prophecy. And you're telling us that what is going on right now, obviously the devout Jews will. Why is Peter, again, this is about sermon and homiletics. How do you uh, um, preach to an audience who are well-versed in scripture? Use scripture. Which is why he's pulling out from his knowledge all the scriptures from the Old Testament, the Old Covenant. And he's telling them, look, Joel said, do you remember that this is going to happen. The pouring of the Spirit of God upon those who believe. Okay, But something for us to take home. You see, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit happened on the day of Pentecost. Joel prophesied it, but the manifestation was completely different. So whenever there is a work of the Holy Spirit, we have to be open to what He wants to do the way He wants to do it. We cannot box God up and say that no God, it, ha it has only got to be prophecy, it has only got to be dreams, it has only got to be tongues or it has only got to be visions. He gets to choose. But by the Holy Spirit, Peter was able to discern. And what did he say in verse 16? This is what was spoken. Or as other translations say, this is that. With a difference. You know, so the manifestation was quite different. So let me quickly come here and uh, look at uh, some of the questions uh, in the chat. Okay, so Elisha, Pastor, please, uh, I cannot find the course notes on the stream. Has it been uploaded? So uh, Elisha, we're not using course notes. Uh, I have. Um, I have posted an overview on our stream page where I said that we are going to use the NKJV version of the Bible, which is what I'm following and, and reading from. So I'm going verse by verse uh, and explaining it to us. Uh, and also for your reading, you can use uh, enduring you can use the commentary on the book of Acts from EnduringWord.com, written by David Guzik. Okay. So uh, yes, coming to Asha, uh, she says, uh, okay. 
fine. So Asha has answered his question. Louis, uh, please go ahead. You have something to say? Um, it's just an observation, Mark. Um, if Joel said all flesh, and at the time when it happened in um, at the day of Pentecost, it was only happening in the context in Jerusalem. So does that suggest that um, Joel is still being unfolded even centuries after? Because um, after then he had to go into Rome, Ephesians, Corinthians, and the likes of it. Is, is that is that a good narrative or a balanced narrative, rather? Uh, okay, Louis, so um, I'm just trying to understand. So you're saying that on the day of Pentecost, it didn't get poured out on all flesh, but eventually you see that it was going, it was reaching many people groups, isn't it? Um, no, what I'm saying is, if you said all flesh, I guess God's, what God's perspective was talking about everyone on the face of the earth. But mm -hmm. in terms of at what point in time of history did he get to that particular quote unquote flesh? Um, is this, it was subject to when the message got to them, because that's when they got the, um, got the upon of the Holy Spirit or the infilling of the Holy Spirit, as the case may be. Mm. So okay. technically, Joel is still still being fulfilled um, up till now, because there are many nations, many tribes, many people that still hear the word of God are being preached to, and they are being filled with the Holy Ghost. So in that sense, it means Joel is still being fulfilled until we get to the context of all flesh. That's 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 what I'm trying to. Own. Yes, to find sure. That's where we are. Sure, sure, Louis. I I agree with that. So God intends for everyone to receive the baptism in the Holy Spirit, just the way He intends for everyone to be born again, right? Yeah. So that's yes, God's ma. Intent. Yes, ma. I guess that's that's yes. Yes, ma'am. Oh, yes, ma all right. Yes, sure. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Oh, sir, uh, who is the author of the commentary which you mentioned just now? Uh, it's uh, David Guzik. David okay. Guzik. Yeah, it's it's also in the overview that I have put up, but let me just oh. type it here. Yes. That's primarily what we are following, but of course, you know, there's a lot more content in what I'm sharing. All right. Mm, so yes, so we've seen uh, what uh, Peter quoted. And uh, here's a sermon that he's making to the onlookers. Verse 22, Acts 2. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs which God did through him in your midst as you yourselves also know. Okay, so let's stop right here. So much to talk, uh, uh, you know, uh, at, at this very point. One is that Peter has a ready-made sermon. I don't think that morning when he woke up, he would have realized that he has to speak to a large audience in a crucial, um, uh, or you know, in, in such a crucial time uh, in the history of the church. I don't know if he was mentally prepared to make the sermon, but you see, the baptism in the Holy Spirit empowered him to do this. Okay, that is one. Then you know, he's talking about the Lord Jesus, the boldness. Remember, Jesus said, you shall be my witnesses. And Peter is being a witness in Jerusalem at that very point. The boldness of the Holy Spirit. I told us it's been less than two months since a controversial figure, you know, for the the, the unbelieving Jews was crucified. And so much happened in Jerusalem because of this man called Jesus. Imagine the boldness of Peter. He says, Jesus of Nazareth, specifically. He's bringing up Jesus of Nazareth. This is the same Peter who ran away. The same Peter who denied Jesus. But the boldness that he carries. What happened to you, Peter? I was baptized in the Holy Spirit. Okay. He says, Jesus of Nazareth. And continues with his courage. He says, a man attested by God. Now, again, it's all blasphemous for an unbelieving Jew to hear. He's like, what are you saying? You're saying this man who was crucified, who was proved, uh, you know, in their minds, they, they would have all their explanations, proved uh, as someone who should be executed. You're telling us that, you know, Yahweh, our God, attested him, approved of him. So, in other words, you're telling us that we made a mistake. 
but that's exactly what Peter is telling them. He's speaking about Jesus of Nazareth attested by God and how he tells them miracles, wonders, signs. Okay, amazing because how is it that the ministry of the Lord Jesus was affirmed by God through the supernatural? So the supernatural affirms our ministry. It's very important. We saw that even in Acts chapter 1, Jesus, all that Jesus taught and, you know, he, he taught and did, same here, attested by miracles, wonders and signs which God did. Okay, so even Jesus was empowered by God or we know more specifically by the Holy Spirit. God did through him in your midst as you yourselves also know. So he's holding them to account and he's telling them, I'm not talking uh, mythology. These events took place right here, you know, less than two months ago. And you are witnesses to what I'm saying. And then he goes on, him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God. He also tells them that this is not unique to God, but God wanted to send a perfect lamb for our redemption and our sacrifice. So, you know, as we go ahead with the sermon of Peter, though it sounds like he's accusing the uh, listeners, it's actually filled with compassion. Because see, you, he's adding the, the foreknowledge, determined purpose and foreknowledge of God. So Jesus came to die. Jesus came to redeem. Jesus came to pay the price. Okay, so even though, you know, people did what they did, God had his own plans in this uh, particular case. And so he says, uh, have taken by lawless hands, have crucified and put to death. So you did your part, but you know, God, God had his plan through it all. Verse 24, whom God raised up. Oh, very controversial sermon, Peter. Uh, and that too, at this point, when the crowds have gathered in Jerusalem, you are telling us that Jesus was resurrected from the dead. Okay, you know, at this very point, for a, a, a normal believer, you would want to run away because you could die for saying something like this, that Jesus, who was um, crucified by the, by the Roman officials, is now resurrected. But what was their, what, what was some of uh, uh, their, you know, perspective? They thought that his body was stolen. But here is Peter saying, whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death because it was not possible that he should be held by it. Wow, this is what Jesus said when he said in Acts 1, 8, and you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be my witnesses. On that day of Pentecost, you see what kind of a witness Peter is you know, to the crowds that needed an explanation about you know, what happened through the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And uh, I'm going to stop right here. But before I close, I just want us to know that uh, Peter is not trying to be, you know, uh, um, accusing of the people or the authorities or, you know, just like a political gimmick, none of that, because we'll see later on, his sermon is compassionate. His sermon is calling people to repentance. Um, so he's just stating the facts, though they they would have been offensive for the listeners. You know, uh, this sermon filled by the Holy Spirit, an anointed sermon that comes from a place of being filled by the Holy Spirit has an incredible outcome where 3,000 people are saved on that same day. So we'll look at that uh, in the next class. And right now I'm just going to uh, stop uh, and request one of us to please pray. If you have questions, please post it on the stream or uh, we'll uh, pick it up in the next class. Uh, well, could somebody please pray and we'll close off today's class. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for revealing to us the wonderful truths of the word, Father. Lord, thank you for this privilege of studying your word, the book of Acts in detail, 
Thank you a lot for the beautiful explanation which we have heard from the pastor. Lord, we glorify your name and thank your name for this grace given to us. Lord, as we continue in the future classes, teach us more from your word, Father. You keep us, Father, that we may understand the deeper revelation of the word and our life may be transformed by the revelation we receive in this class. Bless the pastor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 And thank you, everyone. God bless you. Uh, looking forward to the classes to come. Have a good day. Bye for now. Thank you, Pastor. God bless you too. Thank you, Pastor. God bless you. Thank you, everyone. God bless.